Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Making Awesome podcast. This is season three, episode 22. We're going to be talking all about who are your customers and finding your niche. It is incredibly important as a business that you figure out who the heck you're actually going to sell to. And if your answer is everybody, then really your answer is nobody. There's a lot involved with finding that target market. We're going to be diving into it today. We are going to be figuring out what is a niche and why does it matter? What are the dangers of changing that niche? Dangers of not adjusting your target market as it changes. Understanding that niche and why it's valuable to you. What a passion versus a niche means. Did they choose you or did you choose them? As well as analyzing how they are and why they are your niche and then how to sell to them if we have enough time. So there's a lot to this, and I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Remember, this is a live stream, so if you're listening to this any other day than the 12th of February, 2023, then you've missed the stream. And if you do want to get involved and, you know, hang out with us when we're streaming live, make sure to head over to our YouTube channel, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, all the things you should do and follow us because we try to do these every single weekend live. So I'll get to hang out with everybody here. We got some awesome people in the chat right now. I got Mad Cat USA. We got Queen Lon One. Sebastian Jackal is here as well. I got an awesome group of people hanging out with us today. We're going to be really talking about this kind of thing because... A target market or a niche, right, is so important, so important for a business. Without it, your business will fail. But with it, and if done correctly, you've got a immediate path to success. Uh, Dean KQ4ADJ, which I assume is your call sign for a ham radio, says cheers from Georgia. Black Cannon Model Works says hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming out and hanging. Maybe give people another minute or two before we dive really deep. But, ah, screw it. Let's just jump in. They'll catch up when they catch up, right? A niche, otherwise known as a target market, is absolutely pivotal for a small business. If you don't have it, your small business will fail. And the reason for this is going after everybody means that you're trying to capture 100% of a target audience and of a market. And if that market is the entire globe, it's not going to happen. Not even Walmart has a target market of everybody. And they probably have one of the more broad target markets out there. Amazon would be another example of a very broad target market. But as you see, companies like Target have a more focused target market and niche. And that's because they kind of know what they're about. Looking at everything that involves a target market, it comes down to understanding who is going to buy your products and why. Sebastian Jackal says, insert comedically hard to pronounce German greeting here. Hi, am I supposed to say Guten Tag like Stefan? I, I, I think I am. <laughs> but yeah, I, you can have a very broad target market. That's okay. You can have a very broad niche to start. But it is your goal as a business to work at finding a more refined market. And the more refined you can make it, the more pinpoint your sales efforts, your marketing, everything like that becomes. Because... Again, we end up in this position where you are trying to run a business, not a hobby. Even as a hobbyist that is trying to make a little bit of money here or there, this is important because if you are going to go down the path of setting up an Etsy store, you kind of got to know who the heck you're selling to. Because if you're not just going to be the cheapest person out there, and that's an upcoming episode talking about pricing and all of that, which please don't be. But if you aren't going to be the cheapest person out there, you have to find a way to set yourself out from other people. And that might be finding that community that you fit in quite a bit better than others might. Pez Liz is here hanging out. 
Thank you. Thank you. I know it is Super Bowl Sunday, and that means maybe people are hanging out. Maybe they're pre-gaming. Maybe you all want to pre-game with me. This is water. I promise. I actually had no idea it was Super Bowl Sunday until yesterday when I decided that yesterday was a great day for grocery shopping. What a bad idea that was. Uh, and do don't do that. Don't go out grocery shopping the day before uh, the Super Bowl. That is a bad move. And as Joel Driver says, brain damage ball. That's right. CTE is what it is. But I will say, working with quite a few NFL teams across the United States, we do 3D scanning for NFL teams from time to time. They do seem to take okay you know, care of their players. No one really complained too much. And I absolutely did ask all of those questions because... I, I want to know, right? I have a unique desire to learn more about the safety measures that they do or don't do to ensure the safety of their players because, you know, it's fine. Mac at USA says Amazon is trying to make everybody their target market, but they're not. If they were trying to make everybody their target market, they would make Prime free because then everybody would have access to it. They gate it behind right now $144 a year or $12 a month. And that means that certain people are just not going to pay for it. They even have Amazon student to get the students who might not have as much cash or give them a student discount, if you will. And Amazon, it's way more refined than you think. Because if it wasn't, they, they, they wouldn't exist, right? I look at Amazon and say they've got a really well-defined target, but they're not hitting it perfectly. Amazon really wants to go after the teens, tweens, and young adults. They do end up hitting the older crowd because a lot of them like that convenience, but their target market does really boil down to people that are willing to pay for a bit of convenience and need things really, really fast. Somebody is calling the company. I am not going to answer that. Whoever you are, I will have to call you back. I'm sorry. Although it says scam likely. We're not going to answer calls on stream like we used to. Because that, that's a great way to really make people uncomfortable. So let's not do that. Uh, Jake the Goat. Jake the Jote Goat says, I actually made it to a live stream. Thanks, dude. Thanks for hanging out and enjoying your Sunday with us here on the stream. It's always weird. I, I, I always get phone calls when I am doing something that I can't really get out of, like a meeting or a, a, a you know, a, a live stream like this. There's always something that that comes up and I laugh. I'm like, I should always just book meetings because apparently that's the way to get phone calls. <laughs> um, is what it is, though. We will call them back at the end of the stream. Uh, but yeah, if you guys are hanging out watching, make sure to leave a like. Greatly appreciate everyone uh, joining the stream and hanging out. We got Daniel Craw here coming in. But yeah, Amazon is way more refined than you might think. Uh, because, and, and let's back up to the small business side of this, right? Amazon's a multi-million, if not multi-billion dollar company. Uh they're a little bit different and very much beyond the scope of what we're talking about because I'm not that smart. I only have six years of, of you know, of like schooling. I only have a master's degree. And I promise you I am nowhere near as smart as the people that they've employed. Now, I would say I'm probably smarter than the people inside of Netflix that are deciding to do this whole uh, issue with password sharing because they're absolutely limiting their target market. And, you know, let's actually talk about that real quick. Netflix's whole – they're calling me – are they calling me again? All right, I'm going to answer this one. We're going to answer it on stream. Good afternoon. This is 3D Musketeers. You are live on our YouTube. Oh, go screw yourself. You call me and you hang up. Go screw yourself. Oh, you want to. All right, we can play that game. I'll call you later. Is Filament Stories here? Did I miss Filament Stories in here? No, but they're tagging her. Hi, Courtney. You're just not commenting. Apparently, you're here, but you're not commenting. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk about 
the whole thing with Netflix, right? Netflix is going to be cracking down on password sharing. And that is pissing off a lot of people, primarily those like travel nurses, people that go away on business trips, families that might have a vacation home, people that go out and want to watch a Netflix movie, I don't know, on the beach or something. Because what they're doing is they're limiting who can watch based on IP address. And they started to implement that here in the United States. People got really pissed and then they backed off of it. And I know why they backed off of it. It's not because people got pissed. It's because they had so many cancellations, they firmly decided that was a bad move. Netflix as a whole does suffer suffer from password sharing. This is a known thing. But it doesn't impact them as much as you might think. They believe that it contributes to a vast majority of their struggling to maintain profits. But I would say as somebody who has a... Netflix account with their family through T-Mobile, right? T-Mobile provides us with a uh, two-user Netflix account. I don't live with my parents, but we're all together on a cell phone line because it is way cheaper to do it that way than any other way. And does that mean that I now would have to get my own Netflix account or they would have to get their own Netflix account? How does that work? And what are cell phone carriers going to do that provide the free Netflix? Are they going to be giving each account or each line its own account? I don't know. But this is certainly going to change the way that we look at how Netflix does business. And they are trying to refine their target market this way, right? It is people that, one, can afford Netflix two, don't really travel, and three, if they do travel, are willing to go ahead and spend more money on a second account or even third account. So they're going after way more people than you might think. I am confused by it personally. Uh, I don't really agree with what they're doing. I, I, I think it's a bad move. Because I think they're going to lose more people than they are going to get. Because who are they really going to cater to when they play this, oh, you're only able to use it inside of your house, right? If you even leave your house and go somewhere else, you can't use Netflix. Who are they catering to other than like me, the hermit, someone who doesn't really leave or go anywhere, but that's stupid. Netflix, get your head out of your asses. You're not refining your target market. You're alienating your consumers. And it's not going to result in a good response as far as I'm concerned. But you're a publicly traded company, I think. Pretty Yeah, you should be publicly traded. And since you are publicly traded, well, it's going to show in your stock price because it is your legal duty to make decisions on what will increase your stock price for your shareholders. So good luck. I wish you the best. But yeah, I see everyone is enjoying the, the, the Netflix rant. Uh, I love it. But like, that is the absolute perfect definition of a company that is torpedoing their entire target market, right? They had a target market of people, and there's literally a colloquial term for it, the Netflix and chill, which is watch a movie and then hook up while the movie's still playing in the background. Let's, let, let, let's not, you know, let's not call it what it's not. Um, but, it, like, they've got a whole phrase coined around it, and they're becoming a household name. Something like a Xerox as the previous form for a copy or a copy machine, right? These terms like Band-Aid, right? No, you want a sterile bandage. No, you say you want a Band-Aid. Band-Aid is a company. And you can go get these different brands from other companies, right? But they all benefit from utilizing the name Band-Aid, right? So, yeah, Kleenex, like Mad Cat says, there are so many companies that are like this. And, gosh, Netflix, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I get it that somebody in their accounting department likely said, oh, this is going to help us. 
oh, the people that people aren't going to cancel and we're going to get more people that are not willing to give up our shows and our titles and all of that and are just going to pay us the extra money versus those that are going to decide to go somewhere else. And I'm sorry, I disagree with that. Now, I'm not someone that's making six to seven figures a year doing that kind of analytics for you, but I'm also not an idiot. So, and I'm not calling anybody over there an idiot. That would be slander. Uh, I am simply saying that I am personally not an idiot. I do firmly believe that they're going the wrong way. But we'll see, right? Only time will tell. Their stock price will tell. And if it goes well for them, congratulations. But I can tell you there's a lot more people looking to go back into sailing. Arr, you matey. Versus those that are looking to continue paying for Netflix. <laughs> and it's funny because I'm marking all of these. So if, if those that don't know, uh, we are doing a massive push this year for short form content. Uh, the last podcast... The first time that we did these podcast cutdowns, we got 18 individual videos out of it. And these are all uh, short form content. So every time you kind of see me looking around and clicking things, you can probably hear my mouse click. I am uh, marking podcast cutdowns. Uh, so we have a, a vertical recorder for Zoom. Uh, for OBS, and then we also have a Fathom AI note taker that is also transcribing and all of that. So we, we've got a lot of stuff set up, but we are doing a big push for that short form content because, well, that's what uh, the, the, the mighty mathematicians over at uh, Big Red over there are telling us to do. So, you know, obviously you, you do what you can. Um, so Black Canyon Model Works said Netflix actually backed down after subscriber outcry. They did. So, oh, uh, th this is a fun marketing strategy, and we're going to get into it. Uh, it it it's a straw man marketing strategy. They are putting up a sacrificial goat, which is this whole oh, we're limiting you to the one household. Okay, I would bet dollars to donuts they're going to release a plan in the next quarter that doesn't limit you to just one. It limits you to individual households based on how many people are on your account. So if you have a two-person account, they'll give you two IPs that you can use. If you have a four-person account, you'll get four. Uh, or they're going to give you a, a block of IPs that you can have or not have. So they gave you something that you absolutely hate for, for them to then give you something that's a little bit better for you to say, well, I hated the previous one, but this one's a little bit better, so I guess I'm okay with it. It is... It, it's a terrible marketing tactic, but it actually works. <laughs> so, I, I good on them, I, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. Uh, but it, it is a marketing technique. Companies use it all the time. Um, it, it is kind of more like a, a FOMO, right? Feel, fear of missing out marketing strategy where you are playing on people's emotions and it, you're doing more of social engineering than you are actually marketing. And honestly, it's kind of cool. Like looking at it from the outside, understanding uh, kind of what their goals are, right? Their goals are always to increase revenue year after year after year, right? So they can afford to not only have a higher stock price, but also do more content, right? Netflix is doing a lot of their own content and they've stepped up the game recently with that content so good on them right um oh yeah like mad cat says coke changing to new coke and then pepsi doing a product called i think it was pepsi clear or something like that uh i forget which one of them came out first uh if it was pepsi or coke but whoever came out first the product was actually good it was actually good okay it was crystal pepsi um so whoever came out first was actually good. And then the competitor made one that was dis that was deliberately terrible. Okay, so New Coke was first, and New Coke was apparently very good. And then Pepsi released one that was really bad. They said it was good, but it was deliberately bad. And that was to pull away from how good New Coke was, causing the sales of New Coke to tank. Okay, and that resulted 
in Coke pulling that away. But if you look at one of the big problems with these Coca-Cola, Pepsi soft drinks, it's the coloring. It makes your teeth yellow and the sugar and all of that and all the other bullshit they put in it. But the coloring is like a known thing that causes the staining of your teeth, right? Coffee is the same way. And Pepsi knew that if Coca-Cola was successful in this, it would change the way that soft drink companies would work because a lot of them are marketing not just on the brand name, but on the color, right? You can put Mountain Dew in a clear bottle and remove the label from it and people will instantly know it's Mountain Dew because it is highlighter green. You can put Mellow Yellow into a bottle that is clear and people will know what it is because it is clear. Or is it's that weird yellow? You can put Coca-Cola in a bottle, but you won't know what it is because Pepsi is damn near the same color. And if Pepsi wants to maintain that brand recognition, they're going to have to step up. And besides, clear drinks, that's Sprite, right? That's Sprite, that's Sierra Mist, which are competitors, obviously. Uh, you know, so you... Oh, there's so much more to this. It's so interesting. Once you dive into why companies do what they do, you'll never look at product packaging the same way. And as someone that does a lot of product packaging for companies where we're doing prototypes for them, it is so cool to see the way that people work. Uh, I'll give you a story. Uh, recently, uh, I went to Moe's. Uh, I had my birthday was a little under a month ago, and that means I get a free get a free meal at Moe's. Gotta go get that, and you go on a Monday because Moe's has Moe's Monday. You get two relatively big meals for like ten bucks. Good, you know, good money, cheap meals. Everyone's gonna love a cheap meal these days. It's reasonably healthy. They they have changed their packaging. They're no longer using uh, plastic or anything like that. Well, they're still using plastic, but they changed up their plastic. They're using a beige plastic bowl that looks surprisingly similar to the one from Chipotle, except it's plastic. And their reasoning for it is it's not going to get it's not going to get soggy from all of your food. The difference is it's not compostable like the Chipotle bowl is. The Chipotle bowl is made of a substance called bagasse, not dagas. That's different. Bagasse is a, uh, it's actually produced from the waste from making corn syrup. It's the corn husk and all of that. Uh, there you go. There's your fun fact of the day. Uh, but the big thing that we did in the food packaging industry is we introduced the idea of putting a sauce container in the lid. Moe's saw this. So we we did the packaging. I don't think I can tell. Oh, I don't have an NDA with that company, so I guess I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did it for Glory Days. Uh, Glory Days, right? Was Glory Days the first one that we did it for? You know, I don't know who the first company we did it for. We've done so many of them. Oh, it was PDQ. PDQ was probably the first one that we did it for. Uh, anyways, there are a bunch of companies that we work with uh, in this industry, but Either way, uh, Moe's saw this, obviously. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, I, uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy seeing something that we designed and, and we made first get out there. But I will tell you, Moe's got something wrong. Uh, we built a system that actually locks the sauce container into the lid so it doesn't come out. They didn't get that right. Their sauce containers don't lock into their lids. So if for some reason it gets jostled around a little bit, the sauce container can fall out. It's a thing. Uh, Ted at Chichester. I might get that wrong. From Zephyr Hills. Oh, you're like 15 minutes away from me. Uh, once you find your product, which mailing system works best? Oh, that's a fun one. Um, we use Pirate Ship. Uh, but there's Shippo. There's companies like ShipStation and all of that as well. But we currently use Pirate Ship um, because we do more bespoke stuff and we don't reach a broad audience as 3D Musketeers. We do on YouTube, right? I can tell you my exact target audience on YouTube because YouTube tells me what it is. It is between the ages of 18 and 34. It is anywhere between um, 65 and 71% male and the rest of it is female or uh, other. Um, 
and I know where they're from. I know at least 14% of our viewers are from the United States, but with VPNs being what they are, you can't really trust that all that much. But I can tell you based on comments that the vast majority of our viewers are from the United States. Uh, as Mad Cat says, he's 57, well outside my demographic. That's true, but here, I'm, I'm going to go to it right now so I can see. Uh, I would bet that there's still a fair percentage chance of people in that age range. Give me just a second. So in my analytics, I go to my audience tab. Mad Cat, you are a part of a category that is 55 to 64 years old, which is 3.7% of our viewers. So... Yeah, uh, 53 for Black Canyon. You uh, make up part of the 7.5% of our viewers. Um, so th th there's a thing to it, right? But our audience is more of people that are interested in 3D printing and 3D scanning, but also like to hear a no-bullshit operator actually talk about something and are totally willing to unfortunately lose out on sponsors in exchange for being honest so you know welcome to it but yeah uh we have strayed away from the topic but i guess that's what a lot of you come here for you you come for the fact that the adhd kicks in really really fast and uh yeah it's interesting but yeah ted i'm actually over in wesley chapel so i'm actually not uh too far from ya um yeah so your niche and target market. Also, Ted, if you're watching this channel, then you better know about your turn, a board game cafe over in Zephyr Hills. If you don't know about that, dude, get over there. They're off of Fifth Street. Uh, dude, you got to go check them out. If you're watching this channel, you'd probably love that. Uh, you probably love that. Anyways. Uh, all right. So why should you have a target market or a niche? You should have that because, well, it's kind of, ne it's kind of necessary right? Your target and your niche directly defines how you do your marketing positioning and how you build your business because you're building it to reach that exact audience. Now, when you're first starting, you're going to have a much broader target market, right? I want to reach people that are excited about 3D printing and make videos about it. Great. Okay. We make videos about it. But then as we move forward, we see that it changes a little bit, right? We see that it is predominantly male, but we do have a big female audience as well. We can see that we have a combination of newbies and seasoned professionals, and we can see that people actually like videos where I get a little bit frustrated. And if that's the kind of thing that you like, make sure that you guys get subscribed because there's going to be a lot of it coming very soon. <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, I have a lemon. And in fact, I'm printing a lemon right now behind me, and it's live on Maker Deck, if that's your kind of thing, because I can't print a lemon in this specific color on my bamboo. Don't ask me why. It just continues to fail. It doesn't like that color. That's Yellow Bird by Printed Solid, even though, as you can see, it's got rings on it. So the spool has some rings that I've designed. And, uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't work. It just TLDR doesn't work. My bamboo is an absolute lemon. And uh, Wednesday will be one month since I looked at my bamboo. And so we're going to do a one month uh, review of this machine, talk about it, and you know really uh, break down the problems that I'm having, why I believe they exist, and uh, why, yeah, why, why it's going to be a thing. Philman Story says, I have children and parents, which I didn't expect. So I have to control the swearing, which is always a challenge. Yeah, that's fair. The, um, the podcast, I, 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 I had some requests to try to have less of a potty mouth because there's a couple of individuals that want to uh, have their children listen to this as well. And I am trying, but this is not a, this is not a, uh, I would say under 13 podcast because really at 13 if i don't tell it to them the music they listen to will <sighs> sebastian jackal says i can't print a lot of colors on my bamboo because all my spools are too wide so i've actually designed a couple of different spool rings um and if you are a part of our five dollar patreon or higher i have released those to you already 
Um, I would say that I'm still working on them. This is one of the prototypes for the Jesse spools. It fits great. Like I've got my diameters perfect. So it just snaps in and does come right off. But uh, this part here is a little thin. But what I noticed is with spool risers, it does actually work. The Jesse spools do work, but I can tell that the rear roller is a little bit is a little bit thin. So I think I'm going to look at redesigning the uh, the rear rollers that exist out there and see how I can make them better to use Jesse spools because I am not giving up using one of the best filament manufacturers on the planet printed solid in my bamboo. But I will tell you for some reason the bamboo does not like Jesse filament. Even if you re-spool it, I have not found it to like Jesse filament and I don't know why. Because it it starts to under extrude like crazy. And then when I go to clear what I believe is a clog and I just push more filament through, it pushes through fine. Even at the printing temperature. And I'm using bone stock settings because I'm kind of done with this, right? I'm just going to use bone stock settings on the bamboo. Let it choose everything as much as I like to tune my profiles it's not going to get me anywhere because the company can then blame everything that's happening on me rather than blaming it on the hardware. Um, and like my, here's all the problems I've had. I've had now 12 hot end clogs, which are all happening in the cold end uh, from various manufacturers, from various materials, ABS, PLA, PETG, nylon, polycarb. I've had Every single type of filament that I have clog in those in those hot ends. And it's because of the filament cutter. When it gets jammed, it clogs it, it clogs it. But then when you go to do the unload, it cuts the filament, getting it stuck. I have had an entire extruder completely die on me. Uh it it just it doesn't feed filament anymore. It's really dirty. It's a pain in the ass to clean them. And you gotta really remove quite a few parts. I have had issues with my AMS. I've got a motherboard fan that's dead because uh, the bearing is just screaming like a banshee. Um, yeah, there's uh, what else has happened? Oh, the AI fail detection just doesn't work. Uh, there is a print that was absolutely turning into pure spaghetti and it didn't detect it. But when it fixed itself and was printing okay, then it detected the spaghetti. I'm like, what is wrong with you? And that print that went for like nine hours or something that was just a huge plate of spaghetti, it thought was totally fine. So there is something clearly wrong with my machine. And Bamboo has not yet offered a replacement. And I'm not going to push for one because I need them to offer it. The problem that I'm concerned about is uh, that they know who I am, right? It is, they have mentioned my printer and they've mentioned my channel so they know who i am and if i push for something i don't want them to say oh well he's a youtuber he's a content creator we don't want to upset him um well you've already upset me so that's fine but you know they might choose to replace my my machine faster than they would a regular customer and that's not i'm not trying to get special treatment i want to see what it's like to go through this over and over and over again so the people that are struggling as well that are getting absolutely torn to shreds on social media about it because i am right the amount of comments i have to delete when i'm critical about bamboo is just insane um, yeah, it's just, it's frustrating. And, uh, that community is still toxic and I know that they're working on it, but, um, it's too little too late for me. Um, so yeah, anyways. Oh, uh, <laughs> big B 69 is asking thoughts on the SV 06 plus. I don't have one. Sovol has not reached out to me to do a review on one. I would love to, uh, but Yeah. Um, I would hope that after the content that we did on the SV06, that maybe they would kind of have my name and know my number, but, uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, but if it is as good as the SV06, just bigger, great, buy it. It's a great, it, and if, if it is going to come out at the $300 price point, like I've heard, it, it's going to remove the need to buy the SV06 normal. You might as well just go buy the big one unless you're space constrained for some reason.
And as Madcat USA says, we got over 40 people watching, only 19 likes. Let's fix that. Uh, if you don't mind, like the stream if it's your kind of thing. We'd greatly appreciate your support. And again, if you do want to support us financially, kick a couple of bucks into that creator fund. You can head over to Patreon, YouTube channel members, and all of that. Links are in the description down below. And all of that kind of thing. So, getting back on topic, Grant. Because people are here to learn about target markets and niches. And they're not here to listen to you rant about bamboo. Although I know you all like it. It's not the purpose of this podcast. Uh, if you want to hear all about that, show up next Saturday. Uh, because that will be the official day where I'm going to go through and fix everything wrong with my bamboo at once. And we're going to talk all about it. It's going to be an AMA, so you guys could ask me anything about my career in 3D printing. Kind of my backstory and history. Uh, it's going to be more of like kind of a, a chill stream while I'm working and we're just going to be hanging out. Uh, and yes, I have been bamboozled. Uh, and I, I just, I find it so incredibly funny that the guy who's been critical of them ends up with 11 for the exact, and it's the exact things that I've talked about, that a big company has issues with QC and QA. And I'm literally one of those people. It's just, it, it just makes me laugh. So I'm hoping at some point that I can get this thing running well, and if not get it replaced, but no matter what happens, you guys are going to be taken along for the entire journey, just like you're going to hear all about my current problems with bamboo and the hoops they make you jump through if you want warranty parts. It involves filming a video. So if bamboo wants a video, they're going to get one. And that is me being malicious. Well, maliciously compliant, we should say. Teresa says, I liked your shorts that you did in regarding to getting finance for your business. Yes, Teresa, that is a cut down of a previous podcast. That's exactly what we're doing is we're cutting down the podcast, putting them out as shorts as a way to get people to find the channel so you guys can come and hang out and learn more about your business on the streams. So the live streams for the podcast are normally as much business focused as my ADHD brain can get us. And um, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, I, uh, I enjoy it because it's a great way for me to connect with you guys. It is a great way for, uh, you guys to ask direct questions about your businesses. And it is a good way for me to also kind of learn from the comments of what's worked and what hasn't for everybody and maybe refine myself at the same time. Um, as I'm saying that I have to remember that I have allergy medicine that I need to take. All right. Ugh. Teresa says, I've been a member since your cricket rants. Oh my gosh, you are old school. You are old school. That's like two years ago. That's actually how we started our channel, for those that don't know. It was from cricket. Uh, Film and Story says, it's disappointing that, that some machines, like Uncle Jesse's and yours, have so many problems. When Uncle Jesse got a replacement, things were fine. It isn't good that people are getting jumped on, though. Uh, I agree. It's not good that people are getting jumped on and it is honestly incredibly inappropriate and I get it. There are communities out there and all that. You guys know my stance on all this. I just want people to be nice to each other. That's really all that I want. So why should you have a niche? Defining that target market and niche is so incredibly valuable, right? In previous weeks, we've talked about validating the fact that you have a market, but now you have to figure out how to functionally target them. Because if there are people that buy your products, but you're not pushing your stances towards them, then you've got an issue, right? I want to do a lot of selling of 3D scanning services. Well, that means I have to start pushing more 3D scanning content, writing more content like blogs and all of that about 3D scanning, and even further, offer some companies locally a little bit of a hookup to allow me to film the parts that I might be scanning for them. Uh, so I'm down for it. And like uh, we were just talking at the Bishop Museum with a uh, subscriber actually invited me out to a talk and museums have always been a target for me. I've always wanted to go scan for museums, but museums are so difficult to reach out to because they've got quite a lot of gatekeepers to get to the right person. And unless I take the time to go down to museums and actually walk in the door, bring a scanner, show what it can do and all of that stuff, it's a pain in the ass. Um, so 
this was a great way for me to do it. It's the Bishop Museum of Science and Nature in Bradenton, Florida. And I got a tour, a little bit of a, a nickel tour from Casey, who works out there. And she was lovely, by the way. Thank you, Casey, for your hospitality. But, um, you know, we talked about how we could utilize 3D printing and 3D scanning to kind of buff the offerings of the museum. Things like, let's 3D print artifacts. Let's get high-end 3D scans of artifacts. Let's 3D print them one for one scale and let people actually hold it. That'd be really cool. And when we look at children and even adults that have issues with eyesight, whether they're partially blind or fully blind, taking them to a museum is just, it's not the same as it is for us that are fully sighted. And if we can put those artifacts, whether it's just like, you know, a, a tactile thing that people can touch in front of the exhibit or it's something that someone can hand out, right? When they when they recognize that there might be someone that has a, an eyesight issue and allow them to get a better experience where they can tactily understand it and not just have to have someone who has been able to see their entire lives try to describe something to someone that hasn't it becomes a totally different thing. It becomes a totally different thing. Disney does that for their archives, Teresa says. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. But we've worked with museums in the past um, to pr do preservation of artifacts. Uh, and I want to do more of that stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, that's how we worked with the Smithsonian, by the way. Uh, the Smithsonian is a client and we are their certified backup printer, which is just like one of those fun things that I like to say. Our clients include the Smithsonian, the Snoop Dogg and everything in between. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but yeah, understanding that target market and niche really defines where you're going to move your brand positioning and your brand marketing. If you are a company that is looking to serve individuals who are having issues with their 3D printers and want to fix them for them. You should not have a company that is uh, got a an aerospace style name because those two things don't fit each other. And the nice thing is here in the United States, you could do something called a DBA, which is doing business as. Sometimes it requires a public disclosure in something like a newspaper or something like that. It's normally very cheap to get that thing done. But a DBA allows you to have an LLC or a separate corporation as the parent business. And then you have a, a fake name, if you will, or a name that you are doing business as instead. And that means you can kind of refine the name of your company that you utilize publicly while maintaining an LLC, S Corp, or C Corp, whatever you choose as your business structure on the back end. And that's great for companies that are looking to rebrand because you might need to make a pretty serious name change. Looking back at Moe's, since we talked about them earlier, Moe's went through a significant rebrand in the past couple of years, going away from their yellows and red logo that was like this Southwest grill kind of uh, feature, right? This Tex-Mex Southwest grill. Now they're doing more looking at Chipotle's business. And Chipotle is this fresh, never frozen, handmade right in front of you, right? You know, raw, clean ingredients. And Moe's recognizes that they are effectively a direct competitor of Chipotle. So they have to find a way to reach that similar target market to be able to compete properly. But Chipotle has garnered more of this brand recognition as a hoity-toity company, right? You know, you go to them, you're going to go to, you're going to go to uh, Chipotle and then you're going to go shop at Sprouts and then you're going to go to, uh, you know, your, your local uh, fresh market. I'm trying to think of all like the high-end grocery stores, right? Because it is very easy to spend $20 on a meal at Moe's for a single person or uh, at Chipotle, sorry, for a single person. It's tough to do that at Moe's. Unless you get the case. The case is way too damn expensive. Uh, Teresa says, on their artworks and other items, including their character statues and the largest ones they have done, one of the Snow White ride cars. That's pretty cool. Aldi's Gregory Pfeiffer says, uh, Aldi's is a uh, more affordable grocery store, right? Aldi's is an interesting one for target market. 
You know what? I'm going to use, I'm going to use a good one. Cause I actually did work for this company. Um, checkers, checkers. Okay. This is crazy. I, now I spoke with the director of marketing at checkers and I asked the same thing that I ask any franchise business that we do business with. How do you decide where to put your businesses? Checker says, we like to find, we like to place a checkers in a medium to low income neighborhood. I said, why is that? They said, because we can build an entire restaurant for less than a quarter of a million dollars. And they, and with the work that we did for them, it enabled them to do it more piecemeal and bring in pre-made components. And so we saved them quite a bit of money on their construction costs. I said, well, why is that? They said, because if you have a lot of money outside of having a craving for our fries, you don't have a reason to come to Checkers. We are a fast food chain that really focuses on fast, cheap, calorie dense. And if you don't have a lot of money, that is normally what you're looking for. You need cheap food that is calorie dense. You're not looking for healthy. You're looking for calorie dense. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a thing, um, but like they know their target and it works, right? Find me a checkers that you know of that's closed. They put their, they put it right where, you know, you want to be. So if you're looking to buy a house and you're looking to buy a house in a good neighborhood, if there's a checkers within a couple of miles from you, maybe reconsider where you're buying. It's just cool. And if you're looking for more affordable housing, search for checkers, you'll find it. It, it, it's, it's it's like one of those crazy things. Uh, the Flying J is another one. The Flying J is a is like an off highway gas station. You only see them off of highways, and the way that they used to place their gas stations were the owner and marketing people would get on planes. They had their pilot's licenses, so they would get up into these you know little uh, single engine planes, like a little Cessna one seventy two, and they would fly around and they'd like, huh, there's not really a gas station around here. All right, we'll put one there. Okay, we'll put one there. Okay, we'll put one there. And it works. They know that their target market is looking for a place to fill up. And traditionally, it's because they've passed up a gas station and they're hoping that they can get to the next one. Well, if they put one in a location where there isn't another gas station for a little bit, then they've kind of owned that market for the area. On top of that, they have pretty good service. And the one local to me has a Denny's in it. Or at least used to have a Denny's in it. So you could go get some... Yeah, go get a Grand Slam. Fill up your gas tank. They have showers too, apparently, at the Flying Jane. I'm told they're quite clean, but... No. But, of course, if you are a... Uh, if you're a trucker, you gotta, you gotta make sure that you shower. Uh, Jake the Joat Goat says, Payday loans... Are, payday loan places are another. That's predatory practicing, and I'm... Really upset the government doesn't crack down on it. Payday loans, again, yeah, they, they tend to be in, you know, these medium to low to low income neighborhoods and uh, surrounding areas because those are the people that need that kind of assistance and they're the kind of people that will not read any of the terms. And they're the ones that get preyed on the most. It, it sucks to me that we allow corporations to prey on the people that need the help the most. And instead of trying to help them when they're down, they just try to kick them with a 20 or 30% interest rate. It's just, it sucks. It is what it is, but it sucks. I, I don't, I don't like it. Maker Meraki says, uh, Flying J is traditionally known as a truck stop. Yes, it is. It, and it is a truck stop. It is exactly what it is. Uh, there's one right by me. And there are no other gas stations for truckers in 20 miles in either direction. It's kind of cool. Uh, and there is a rest stop right by them. But the rest stop is nowhere near big enough for all the trucks. I live right off of I-75. And... Uh, that I-75 runs north to south. So, fun thing. Uh, odd number interstates run north to south. Even number runs east to west. I-4 runs east to west. In Florida, I-75 runs north to south. And I-75 goes way up into the United States. Like, I-95 runs across the entire eastern seaboard. Uh, I-75 runs up, kind of up through and into Atlanta. Uh, and further on beyond that. But, um, 
Yeah, it fly, the Flying J is right there. They have no competition in the area that are truck accessible. And they recently put in a truck wash. And if you've seen a car wash for regular cars, they're kind of cool looking. One for big rigs is even cooler. Like just from an engineering standpoint, it is way harder to build one that can wash a big rig. Because big rigs really vary in their design and style. It's cool. It's cool. Um... Anyways, anyways, understanding that brand position and target is like pivotally important for your company. If you believe that you want to go after high profile clientele, but all you're reaching are the upper middle class, maybe you should look at redefining either your brand position and brand marketing to better reach that higher end market or adjust and change your niche and your target market a little bit to better reach the people that are already using your services. And that brings up the key about changing your niche and target market. As makers, it is so easy for us to change our target market because the 3D printers that we use, like the ones you see behind me, can make anything for anyone, anywhere, by and large, right? There are obviously going to be some restrictions there. But when we look at the opportunities, it can get really tough for us to define a target market that we stick with. And that is absolutely pivotal when it comes to running a business. Ack, hit the button. Thank you. Jeez. <sighs> I survive goes up to the upper peninsula of Michigan. Okay, there you go. Uh... Shout out to the UP. Uh, Pesla says, yes, we have a paper mill in my community. They actually installed a truck wash there and let people use it. It's crazy big. That's cool. Film and Story says, I have to go. Symphony of Children. Always good to hear your perspective, Grant. Don't forget to like the stream all. That's right. Listen to Film and Stories. And if you are looking to get new types of filament, look at exploring other colors and other types of materials, go check out Filament Stories' YouTube channel. Uh, she is amazing. Courtney is an awesome person, a former podcast guest, and an all-around awesome, awesome person. A backyard Boogie says the major highways are built with the military in mind so they can get around the USA quickly. Yep. Uh, apparently, it ends in Salt Santi Marie in Ontario. Pretty crazy. Maker Meraki says, we have Bucky's, like a truck stop for travelers. They're awesome. Cleanest bathrooms ever. Ironic number eight. Uh, no 18 wheelers are allowed. Bucky's just got into Florida. There's a Bucky's over in Daytona. And uh, the thing with Bucky's is they actually have like fresh brisket, and that's a thing. Um, Bucky's is known for having a lot of their own branded products for people to buy. Uh, and it's kind of cool because it is not just a place to fill up, it is an experience. And so people will drive from all over to go there. And here's the, the, the secret about gas stations. They make very little, if any, profit on the actual fuel itself. They make most of their money on the convenience store aspect of it. So a, a gas station that is as big as Bucky's has a convenience store attached to it that is making their own products. So they're the ones that control all the margins. There's no upcharging or anything that they have to do. It is pure profit. There's no middleman involved. And they're creating an atmosphere where people want to come out there. They will drive a distance to go to Bucky's. They have created the perfect business because you're going to go there. You're going to get a little bit of gas. You're going to go inside. You're going to have a meal. You're going to get some of their Bucky's nuggets that are apparently amazing. And you're going to pay and you're going to get and they're going to get all the profit from that. They don't have to pay any other middlemen. And it is amazing here in florida we have loves um jake the joke goat says we have loves gregory Pfeiffer says loves his god tier uh oh they're beaver nuggets okay they're beaver nuggets uh i draw make Meraki says i drop at least a hundred dollars at bucky's when i go on a road trip um yeah i when i was traveling up to tallahassee a couple of times i think it's the busy bee uh, that's out there that has a similar, it's a similar style to Bucky's. Um, yeah, but like, think about it, right? All of these companies are fundamentally setting 
their target markets, who they work with, and why. Why shouldn't you? Now, I get it. You're not a multi-million dollar company yet. And if you are, maybe you should support 3D Musketeers. We're open for sponsorships. Reach out and talk with us. And brand partnerships as well. Um, I would love to... Uh, um, I'd love to work with some meal kit companies right now. That's like the, the thing I'm looking for is some ideal meal kit companies to work with. Cause I do think we could integrate it well into the content, um, and do good, uh, ad placement for them, but also because food's really expensive right now. And if I could remove that expense from my monthly expenditures, that would be a huge, huge help on me. <laughs> Uh, Sebastian Jacko says, I watch 3D Musketeers for the local Florida dining tips. Uh, okay. If you are in Tampa and you are looking for a place to eat, I highly recommend Bangkok Sushi up in Lutz, Florida. It's like 30 minutes north of Tampa, directly north of the airport. It's actually where I met Uncle Jesse for the first time because it is some of the best sushi in Tampa Bay for the money. I, yes, you can go down to Ebor and get bluefin and all that kind of shit, but I ain't got that kind of money. Um, Bangkok has some of the best and their, uh, spicy Thai basil fried rice. God tier. It is so good. It is so freaking good. Anyways, <laughs> this is, uh, oh yeah. Back here. Boogie says up North on the East coast, repping Wawa. We got Wawa's down here too. Their hoagies are great. When I used to dance, uh, I would help with the setup and teardown. Go figure. Because I handled a lot of the AV stuff there. And after every time, we would either go to... Uh, what was it? The place that has pie. What the hell? The Village Inn. We'd either go to the Village Inn or we would go to Wawa. I particularly liked Wawa because they had pretty decent chicken salad for a late night gas station. Right? So I'd get a chicken salad hoagie or I would get... Uh, you know, whatever the special was, you get a milkshake, although getting a milkshake right after doing, you know, over an hour of dancing is not a great move. Uh, just, you know, for reference, uh, Special Jack says in, if you're ever visiting Frankfurt, e.g. for form next, I'll show you the best schnitzel place in the area. I would love to go to form next, but I am really concerned that I probably won't be able to afford it. So if we can get some companies that would love to work with us, fly us out there and have me take a look at the cool tech, I would love to do that. Uh, it would be bringing two, team, bringing two of our team members out there. So myself and somebody else minimally. Um, so it's a thing. All righty. Um, so yeah, like dangers of changing this niche. Um, it is, it is complicated, right? Again, as makers and with 3D printers, I can go from making car parts one day to making medical parts the next. But the problem is if you change your niche so often, then you are not you know, presenting a brand image to anybody that is cohesive and proper. It is okay to change your target market from time to time. But if you're changing it more, especially as a maker business, more than a a once or twice a year max, you truly don't understand what your business is really catering to. And you have to go back to your books and see where your sales are coming from and who you might actually want to work with. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with going back to basics and looking at where your money comes from, because you might find that who you think you do business with and who you actually do business with is a little bit different. Don't be afraid to go back. It's okay. We do it all the time. I highly recommend from time to time you go back and check and make sure that everything is on that straight and narrow. Because if you don't, it is very easy to get on a wrong path that leads you to just some bad news for your bottom end. And bottom end, I probably should have said bottom line. It leads you into some bad news for your bottom line. There. Andrew's going to hate that. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> We got Mike from Never Let the Machines. Winston, everyone tap that like button and show your support for Grant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. So looking at changing it, right, that's problem. But also keeping your niche the same can be a problem, right? Now, Grant, you might say, Grant, you are 
contradicting yourself. You just told me not to really change my niche, but now you're saying you have to. Well, yeah, right? As you have the ebb and flow of your business and what all of that looks like, it will be common for you to need to change up your product offerings and change up who you're working with. We let a lot of our clients define really what we are as 3D Musketeers. We, we know who we are, but if we're getting a lot from this particular industry, then great. We're going to, we're going to push more into that industry than we were others because it's working more, right? Marketing is not an overnight success for a lot of people. It takes days, weeks, months, years to build a proper target audience. And if you are saying, no, I want this, I want this, I want this, and you're only getting something else, maybe you should look at that something else and say, well, wait a minute, if this is an easy market for me to get, why don't I push more into it and cater to them rather than me trying to cater to someone who doesn't notice me? This similarly, similarly works with relationships. If you keep going after a certain type of person and it's not working, but for some reason you're attracting a different type of person, step back and say, am I putting out the type of vibes that this type of person would want, right? Dating and business are not all that different at the end of the day, right? It is about that communication. It is about trust. It is about pricing, I guess, is a little bit business only, maybe, you know, there... There's a lot. Um, and if you look at just targeting niches as a business and like, I just want to work with other businesses, like three is 3D Musketeers want to focus on working with other businesses. Totally fine. I'm down for it. Love working with other businesses. But every now and then we get a consumer that comes to us, which is fine. I'm happy to do the parts. But they're not our core clientele. We want to work with inventors who are really trying to start their journey of inventing and grow as a person, grow as a brand for themselves and what all of that looks like. I also don't think that my camera is taking photos. I can hear it focusing, but I can't hear it taking photos. Huh, that might suck. Might be doing an entire time lapse for nothing, but I'll make another one. There's no big deal. I have to make more. I have to make more lemons. For the bamboo, I'm going to fill the entire bamboo with 3D printed lemons for the video. Shh, don't tell anybody. Jake the Joke Goat says, I am targeting niche businesses, truck tools, local farm supply, and small factories. The only 3D printers around me only print toys and don't do their own designs. And see, that's a great market. If you happen to live in a more rural area that has farming and you are not targeting farmers, you are out of your mind. Like farmers truly understand the need for right to repair. And if you as a 3D printing company can help them repair their farm equipment faster, easier, and more affordably than going to John Deere or whomever they buy it from, oh my God, do you have a business. But you better understand how a farmer does business. Because if you come in there touting that you're the, you know, you're the, the king dick in town, you're not going to survive. They need someone that understands what it's like to work in a field all the time and have a company try to take advantage of them. You have to earn their trust before you earn their wallets. And if you don't continue that trust, they're going to find somebody else who will. Farmers, like a lot of businesses, are old school. They're old school. And if you try to play new school with them, you're going to have a bad time. So you got to make sure that you're targeting them as people and not them as farmers, right? Because they are people. But treat them like business owners. Treat them like people. Uh, Noobs fan sub says, are you printing a lemon on the Prusa now? Yes, I am. I am, and it is live on Maker Deck. That's your kind of thing. I would print it on the bamboo, but the bamboo won't use this filament. It continues to fail with this filament, even though it's got rings on it and it rolls nice and smooth. It doesn't like this filament. Prusa loves it, no problem. <laughs> they are not Soylent Green, even though they are people. That's right, Soylent Green. 
tastes like people. Um, I will say Soylent as a meal replacement is actually not bad. Not bad. Ted says, seen a couple of YouTube videos where they are focused on what everybody else was printing instead of something original. I get that. Um, like, as a content creator, it is a lot easier for me to make a video on, like, the zoo ghosties when everybody was doing it too. I could have easily made videos on that. But we chose actively not to because that's a hype train that I'm just not going to get involved in because as a lot of these hype trains are, they are very short lived. And as soon as they taper, it's a cliff down. And it, let's say you've invested a ton of money into white filament to print these ghosties a week or two after Halloween, you're going to see sales go from this to this. And it is all about understanding that brand position. And if you were good at it, you would know that that's coming and try to predict what the next wave is going to be. Fidget spinners are probably the best example of this. Everyone remembers when they were big and every store was out of them. I called around to every major toy store in a 20 mile radius and then said... I can make them custom. So when you run out of them, send people to me because I am where you can get them. We made over $9,000 in one month on fidget spinners alone. And as a 3D printing business, when that entire market fell off a cliff and all these companies were left with tons of inventory, I might have had like 30 or 40, maybe 50 bearings, you know, in stock. But that was it. I had some extra filament, but we'll go through that over the years. And 608 bearings are useful for other things. We knew that we could easily play this game of we can work right up until the fad falls off and then move on to another one. It worked beautifully. That is what business is all about. <laughs> and I loved it, man. It was so much fun. We had all these young entrepreneurs coming in that wanted to sell it to... Uh, to their, you know, to their friends in school and we were cutting them deals on, on multiples. They'd bring their parents in and like, you would see the mom or dad whisper into their ear, what tell me, because it was a known thing that the kids would do the negotiation, not the parents. I refuse to work with the parents. Like if the kids want to turn this into a business, I want to work with them. And it was a really cool learning experience for them because initially I'd be a hard ass and not give them anything, right? Not give them a single bit of, uh, of discount but as they would push i would give in a little bit a little bit because i know what my margins are i know i can give them a little bit because they're going to order batches and bulk from me rather than ordering one or two right if a kid came in and ordered 30 they're going to get a much better price and that is a good thing to look at as a business. I know for 3D printing, at some point, the printers only move so fast. You could only move a bamboo or a Voron or something, um, you know, so fast. You are limited. At some extent, you're limited. And if you don't take that into account, you're going to find yourself overrun with way too much work and not enough machines to do it. And when you have clients that are expecting parts and they don't have them, they get mad. They get real mad. Um, <laughs> don't tell the secrets to a farmer in a cornfield. It's full of ears. Oh, Mad Cat, you are truly a dad. Noobs fan sub says, I went to an agriculture fair the other day and saw a few robots full of 3D printed parts and 3D printed inserts for traditional tools as well. Yeah. Uh, you all have all these really, really bad farmer jokes, and I'm here for it, just so you know. Just so you know. Um, <laughs> Mike from Never Let the Machines Win L -L N L T M W. Says, I sell the occasional spinner. That's true. And that's okay, right? If you want to keep it up and public for people, go ahead. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but yeah, like with every, and he's saying, you know, so you're saying that I should print dragons. No, I don't think so. There's enough market out there for dragons, unless you're doing a very unique filament that it, that nobody else has. Maybe it's a unique color that you had custom made or a unique type of filament and you're working directly with a manufacturer. There is so much, so much behind this. 
But because Etsy is overrun with dragons, unless you're going to go sell locally at like a craft fair or a flea market, you are going to have a lot of trouble standing out from the chaff. So if you are someone that wants to print the dragons, right? L let's talk about the dragons. Your niche is pretty well defined, right? Because other companies have defined it for you. You can look on Etsy and see what companies have the most sales of these and understand what price point sells the best. Generally speaking, it's the cheap ones or the ones that have really, really good photos, right? That are using, you know, very fast changing color filament and ones that are printed on belt printers because then the rainbow is down the dragon rather than up it. it, it it's a pretty interesting uh, differentiation. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to just do them in single color and not do anything special, then you're not really innovating. You're just adding to the chaff that the average person has to weed through. So, Mac says, I got a box of bearings in my part, or maybe I should make a couple just to see if anybody wants to run. <laughs> Uh, Jake says, I was actually explaining 3D printing to a friend of mine that is homage. His amazement was fantastic. I talk about 3D printing pretty easily and say it's just a big computer controlled hot glue gun. And that is really what it boils down to. It's just a big computer controlled hot glue gun. If you are able to do it correctly, you just move a hot glue gun duct tape to an Etch-a-Sketch up in a Z-axis as well. You got yourself a pretty basic 3D printer. It doesn't require a lot of craziness to it, but you're going to run really, really terrible um, numbers on it because it's not going to hold any tolerances. Maca says, I sell pretty much just to my coworkers. Great audience. I just have to leave the print on my desk and someone will inadvertently come by and ask how much. I would caution you or anybody about selling in your day job. If the company that you work for gets wind that you're doing this kind of thing, they might not take very kindly to it and tell you to stop or tell you to leave. Uh, so if you are going to do that kind of thing, make sure it's okay. Uh, or if nothing else, get everything in cash and tell everyone not to say anything. You know, stitches get stitches and such. Um, but also recognize when a target market chooses you. An example for us is the food packaging industry. I never looked at them because why the hell would a food packaging company want to do business with us? They've got injection molders. Why would they want 3D printing? Uh, turns out they do. And turns out uh, you don't speak to the traditional people that you would think. I'm not going to tell you who you speak to because that's exactly how I get my business. But I know precisely who to ask for in every one of the companies that, that we do business with because it is a very particular type of person. It's phenomenal. But you know, we went in, I met with a couple locally, had one of my most interesting client meetings ever. We'll tell that in a, in a future podcast episode. Let me know if you guys want me to tell about some of our craziest client stories. I, I, it might be a fun podcast episode, but it's going to be an odd one. Uh, so if you want, you can ask me those questions next week, next Saturday, when we do the bamboo repair video, assuming it comes in, in time. Because uh, that is going to be next Saturday's stream. And we might have a stream coming up this week. So stay tuned for that. Um, I, 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 I'm going to try to do it. We got a Revo Point range. Uh, and I've had it for a little bit. And I would like to play with it on stream. So if you guys are looking at backing the Revo Point range on Kickstarter, I'll be happy to show it. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money. And I will make many disclosures that this is a Kickstarter. And I got it for free. Uh, but we will, um, we'll definitely be doing a stream of that very soon. Very, very soon. But yeah, like the food packaging industry chose me, right? But I'm an idiot if I don't take advantage of that, right? The first company that came to us worth a fair bit of cash and they do a fair bit of business with us every single year. And I love it. They're great to work with. They're incredibly communicative. It's a little tough to get them to pay the bills, but it's because their email is very tough to get through. So I just text the people that I need to text the links to pay me. Very simple, right? Makes life really easy on us. And in turn, we've taken their sales cycle from upwards of 20 plus months down to as little 
as six months or less. That's pretty damn cool if you ask me, right? That means that they're able to turn and burn more business, keep their factories running, and go there. Worse, Peter says, is it food packaging for retail stores or for restaurants? Um, I probably shouldn't say, but it is food packaging, so you can pretty much figure that out. We have worked for both restaurants and for end consumer product packaging, but as a lot of you know, 3D printing is not food safe or body safe. Uh, so you can't do it for end product. I do know that companies will do testing with real product, but they know to throw it away when they're done. Um, because we don't guarantee any cleanliness or anything about it. Uh, but it's okay if a niche chooses you. It only takes a couple of big companies for you to say, I should probably pay attention to this. And when your brain is saying, wait a minute, I've just made like three grand in two weeks. Don't ignore that. If, if a market is trying to tell you, hey, hey, I want to do business with you. Don't ignore that. Let it flush out a little bit. See if that works. And if it does, keep going down that path. I understand it might not be exactly what you want. But if it pays your bills and makes you a lot of money to start, buddy, you can go pursue your dreams in a little bit when you've got the cash to do it. Right? For now, stick with making the money. Chase your dreams when you can afford it. And I know that that might be controversial. I know that's going to be crazy controversial. But here's the deal. I haven't taken a paycheck in seven years. This is year seven. I am taking a paycheck this year. I am taking a paycheck this year. I am going to get this company to a point where it can pay me a reasonable paycheck. It is going to happen. Now, technically, I don't know if it is. But I'm going to tell myself constantly that it is going to. Because again, you kind of write your own futures. If you sit there and say, well, I don't know if this is going to work. I could fail. I could do all this. Of course you could fail. Statistically, you're going to fail. But if you walk into this and say all you're going to do is fail, you're going to fail. Now, if you plan for failure and expect success... If it does fail, you've got a net to catch you. But if it does succeed, buddy, ride that friggin' wave as long as you can. Because at some point, that wave is going to stop. And you got to be ready to jump off that board and start paddling out until you get to the next one. Because that's what surfing's all about. And business is a lot like surfing. It's from one wave to the next. It's fun. But rogue waves come, and sometimes... It's not all that choppy out there, and the waves won't be good for you to ride. It's okay. Come back tomorrow. There might be better waves. <laughs> uh, let's see. I see we've had some comments I want to go back to. I, I was getting on a good rant there, and I really wanted to flush that one out. Mr. M. Don says... I am multiple years away. From, I am multiple years away from retirement. I want to start up selling items on Etsy as a supplement to my retirement. My target market, as of yet, has not been defined. That is totally okay. Take some time and see what works. I recommend if you're going to look at selling on Etsy, don't follow the trends because you really do have to compete on price or quality of your photos. Look at doing something that you are uniquely qualified to do. If you're a car guy or a car gal, or maybe you like living on a farm, maybe you have some chickens or some goats or something, and you've noticed that you can utilize 3D printing to make their lives a little bit better. If that's a custom design that you made or you have commercial rights to sell it, that might be something that you can put up there and market it toward that specific target market. It is a lot easier to market toward a target that you already fit in, that you already understand and are passionate about. It is a lot harder for you to jump into a new market with absolutely no experience. So stick to your guns for now especially when you're starting. Know what you know and work with what you know. If you want to go back to school, proverbial school, and learn something new, learn a new market, go ahead. But it's going to be a lot harder for you to do that than it will be for you to take advantage of a market that you already know and might already have some decent pull in, right? It's totally fine. 
And it's accepted. It's what a lot of people do. Don't be afraid to do it yourself. And like, we're going to do the same thing here, right? We have the Making Awesome Academy and The Politician. These are two products that I'm working on. The Making Awesome Academy is a learning management system designed to help first-time inventors that are looking to get their ideas off the ground. It is going to have a set fee for a fixed amount of time because I believe if you are not able to complete the program in that fixed amount of time, then you're not serious about your actual invention. It's going to have a lot of tough love in it. It's going to have a lot of very interesting talks. And a lot of the podcasts that we've been doing will directly connect with the Making Awesome Academy, where I will go into much further detail in a close to more scripted format without all this craziness behind me. So if that's your kind of thing and you are looking to learn more about it, get subscribed because the Making Awesome Academy will start to sponsor videos in the 3D Musketeers YouTube channel as soon as it is live. Same with The Politician. The Politician is our product designed specifically for the uh, 3D printing industry, for resin printing and FDM printing where you need a heated chamber. And it can heat a chamber upwards of 60 degrees centigrade, which is way too hot for resin, but if it can do 60, it can easily do 30 and also filter the air at the same time. It might not work amazing as a filter, but it will certainly do something at keeping the smell down. We're not going to make any claims about VOCs, but it should hopefully keep the smell down. And if it doesn't work, I've got 11, or if it doesn't sell well, I've got 11 resin printers here that I'm going to put it in and not give a damn if it does amazing or not. It's a product that fits my exact need and a problem that we have here at 3DM. So why wouldn't we take advantage of it, build a product that we would be building anyways, and look at how we can position it to sell in an actual market. Worst Peter says, uh, a buddy of mine has a sign making company and, he, and the horse owner niche has found him. He makes so much money from selling custom signs for horse boxes. Hey, right? Like, would you ever think as a sign maker you're going to make little nameplates and signs for horse boxes? No, you wouldn't think that at all. But hey, if the market's found you, don't ignore it. Now, if it is the wrong market and you don't know anything about it and you don't want to do it, that's fine. You're making a conscious decision to not take on that business. And that's okay. But as a starting and small business, you got to make that money. If you're at a point where if you say no to a customer, it's not really going to hurt your business all that much. It might be worth taking that plunge and being able to get those parts or whatever it is out to somebody faster instead of telling them, well, no, we can't do that for you. But that's why I recommend a small business that you partner or strategically align with other people that might be similar to what you do. You can choose either in your local community or you can look, you know, kind of in your surrounding states where you might have a company that isn't geographically close to you. So you guys aren't all that in uh, competitive, but you guys can trade work back and forth as your target markets change. It is incredibly valuable to have that because it also increases your ability to expand your production. You won't make as much money, of course, but it allows you to expand your production for little or no cost. And the last thing you want to do is get caught with a ton of machines that are idle because idle machines are a waste of money. So, Keep your machines busy and outsource the work you can't handle until you feel comfortable with having idle machinery or your business is doing enough to where you don't have that problem. It's a tough one because with any service-based business like the 3D printing industry, it will wax and wane. Some days it'll be good, other days it won't. It happens to the best of us and it is completely and utterly normal. Don't get defeated because of it. You got this. I believe in you. Oh, I make references to things and you guys just make more dad jokes. I don't know if I'd love you or hate you. Mr. Emden says failure doesn't mean to stop. Um, to some extent, if you continue to fail over and over again and your brand, your brand message doesn't hit its defined target and is really not hitting anybody, you might have a problem that doesn't need to be solved that bad. And therefore, you don't have the niche that you are trying to get. 
So at some point, don't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. As Einstein has said, that's the definition of insanity. What we want is for you to explore multiple markets at a time. Have those marketing strategies so you're more of a sniper for a one shot, one kill, rather than going out there with a shotgun full of bird shot. It's okay to start with that shotgun, but at some point you gotta graduate to the sniper. Because if you don't, you're gonna sit there and wonder what the heck kind of a business am I running? Once you graduate to that one shot, one kill mentality, when it comes to doing business, you have a greater chance of success because you know your target, you know what you're capable of doing, and you know when to take that shot. Don't be afraid to take the shot, but don't hesitate either because wasted time equals wasted money. And you only have a certain window to capture it before somebody else might jump in and do it for you. So... When you have a chance and you want to leap, leap, but make sure you know what the landing is before you hit it. Oh man, these are great. These are really good little nuggets we got here for you guys. Um, what Pezlas said something about, ah, Pezlas says, I love entrepreneurs with family money. Because uh, Worst Peter says, business pro tip, have wealthy parents or family. Let others be your plan B for failure. Okay. Um, it's not bad to have a family or a significant other that can support you in the times that you might not be successful. But I can certainly attest to the fact that it can make you complacent in those times where things aren't going great for you. Right. Where you can say, well, I can ride through this. My target will come out in the end of it. We lost a contract that was worth at least a quarter of a million dollars a year at the beginning of the human malware, if you will. And for the first month, I said, OK, we'll get through this. It's not going to be a big deal. April 9th of 2020 is when I hurt my back and uh, I had to really look at how things were going to be a little bit different. We got lucky um, in that we had a little bit of cash in the bank to sustain us while we figured out what the hell the new normal was going to be for us. And I had a great team, still do have a great team of people who were willing to volunteer their time to help out however they could. And not only the business, but also their surrounding communities to volunteer, to help, to do PPE and all the stuff that we've done. But we lost a lot of money. In 2020, we barely broke even. And in 2021, we did not, did not post a profit. We posted a pretty significant loss. And that money comes directly out of the company bank account, which has money in it for a rainy day. We used most of our rainy day fund to get the company through 2021. So I said, this shit's got to change. And so we changed it. And in 2022, we had, uh, we had, I mean, infinite amount uh, percentage points above the previous year because it was a positive number rather than a negative number. Um, but we survived and we made a good amount of money considering all the expenses that we have incurred, uh, particularly surrounding the YouTube channel, right? The YouTube channel amounts to over $15,000 a year in expenses currently before we're ramping up our content, before we're starting to produce more content, right? And as we start to add more people, like I'm, I'm starting to do research on what I would look for in a producer and look at hiring a producer role to assist us in bringing in those brand partnerships, help us plan videos and that kind of thing. That is a whole extra expense on the company that right now it can't sustain. And that's why you see me doing a lot of these call to actions for people to support us financially, because I don't take, <coughs> excuse me, I don't take any money from the YouTube channel right now. It is barely self-sustaining and that's good because it means I'm not pumping money into it either, but we want to get to a point where it is making us a lot of money so we can afford more people and do more cool things. So. Anyways, oh, Peter, 
by the way, guys, if we're if you see some comments from Worst Peter that look like trolling, they're probably trolling. Uh, to the user in the bamboo video that uh, did not understand that what Worst Peter had commented was an absolute joke and was a dick to him, I am so sorry. But we were making fun of you. I told you we were making fun of you, but we were making fun of you in, in the comments. Because we were, we were all talking about what is the worst comment that could be on the video. And instead of commenting it in the Discord, Worst Peter decided just to put it as a comment on the video. And good lord, it got a lot of attention. I, I just laughed at it. Uh, but as Jake says, avoid paralysis by analysis. Yeah. You can only do so much market research before you just have to send it. And I get it. You want to know every single aspect about what you're getting into before you get into it. I feel you. But guess what? Guess what? You're not gonna. You're not gonna. And if you say, well, Grant, Facebook knows, Apple knows, and Moe's knows, Amazon knows, Netflix may not know. All these other companies know. Why shouldn't I? Because go look at Apple's first logo. It had Isaac Newton in it. Do you think I, do you think that Apple knew what their brand is when their logo has Isaac Newton in it? No, they didn't know, but they sent it because they had a belief and they said, we will figure it out later. Let's fail fast, fail forward, fail often. It's okay. I believe in you, but you also have to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, you're never going to get it done. So be careful. You got this. You can make it happen. Uh, uh, apparently a mem at Pez is an amazing producer. Yep. That's true. Uh, Pez Liz is the executive producer for maker deck and does a phenomenal job as a producer. Uh, Liz is awesome. Liz is an awesome person, both on and off air. Liz, you're great. Noobs fan stuff says that's a side effect of starting a group of DGens. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we have a cool community. And uh, as I've said, my favorite channel in our Discord is the Post Your Pets channel, uh, where everyone posts pictures of their dogs and cats and all that. And I just love that channel because on days when we're not doing great in the business or I'm not doing great mentally, because it happens to everybody, I can go there, get some of the feel goods, and then go there. As Ted says, don't sell to low like he sees some people on Etsy. Yeah, don't be the cheapest guy on the block. That's how you lose money, how you lose customers, how you create a air for yourself as cheap. You don't want to be cheap. You want to be affordable. <clears throat> Sorry. But like me, I... uh. I don't really want to be that affordable. Like there's some extent where we do affordable work for consumers, but for businesses, they can afford more money. And I want to make more profit because at the end of the day, profit is how we move and drive our business. And if we're not creating profit in a meaningful way, then we're not succeeding as a business. If we can't employ others, if we can't employ ourselves, if we can't live off of the money that we're making, then we need to look how to make more money. And oftentimes it's by raising your prices. We will do an entire video coming up soon. So get subscribed if that's your kind of thing, all about pricing. And I'm going to do another video about how to start your maker business coming up soon as well. Main channel videos. So that's going to be a thing too. But yeah, guys, don't uh, don't price too low because you'll find yourself being cheap rather than affordable and you never want to be cheap. Right? Like, honestly, I, I see these billboards for these. And it's in Tampa. There are billboards for uh, vasectomy companies that are offering, you know, $400 vasectomy. I want to be very clear with you. If you are getting a vasectomy because you've decided you don't want to have kids? Do you want to go to the place that does it for $400? Or do you want to spend a little bit more money and get it at a place that does it for $600 or $1,000 or $1,200? It could be the same procedure. I don't know. 
But I ain't trust it to, you know, the cheap guy on the block. Hell no. I've made a financial decision. And, you know, if the difference of even $1,000, the difference between having a kid and not having a kid, when you don't want to have a kid, spend the money now. It's way cheaper than fixing that mistake later. <laughs> Worse, Peter says, for $400, I will do it myself. I, uh... I can't recommend that. Cannot recommend that. NLTMW Mike says, as far as I can see, most 3D printing Etsy sellers aren't even covering their material costs after Etsy takes their costs, let alone power repairs, etc. I kind of agree with you. They're not doing it in the States, right? They can do it in Europe because they can get way, way, way cheaper filament out of China than you can in the United States, right? Because we have import duties and taxes that some European countries don't have to deal with. And even with VAT, it is okay. It gets the job done, right? But yeah, they're working for pennies on the dollar. But if their living expenses are lower, they could win, right? But just because you might have a cheaper living expense does not mean that, oh, I have a cheaper living expense. I can just reduce the amount of money that I charge. No, stop it. Stop it. Don't do that. Um, Asker says EEV blog. Dave says you have to have between three and four times cost to get the business going in the long run. I would say even more than that, right? Especially especially 3D printing. Because if you're doing, you know, let's say, as Ronnie says, ah, reasonably cheap PLA in Europe is $20 per kilo. Uh-uh. If you buy in bulk out of China, you can get it for less. I promise. I promise you can do it. Um, and a lot of these people do. But three to four times cost on a kilo, that brings you, let's just go on the high end, five times cost at 20 bucks gives you $100 a kilo for 3D printing. A set of armor for an Iron Man suit is what? Three to four kilos, maybe five. Let's call it five kilos. So it's $500 is what you would charge for an entire suit of armor from an Iron Man suit. Do you know how long that's going to take you to print? Do you know how little you're valuing your time by the hour? And I get it. It's machine time. They work when you sleep. But that doesn't mean that you should sell machine time for pennies on the dollar. $500 for an entire suit of armor is theft. Well, you're being stolen from. Because people are taking advantage of you. And maybe if you have a big print farm that is auto-ejecting parts and all that, you might be able to get away with it. But homie, 3D printers aren't fast. Even, you know, printers like the Bamboo or a Voron or other machines with Clipper and uh, the accelerometer and the hot end. You're not making any money. And when the average Iron Man suit will take many, many days to complete on a single printer, you just got to raise your rates. Like, I won't do a helmet for less than 600 bucks. I won't even quote a helmet. If the client doesn't have at least $600 to spend because it's not worth my time. It is simply not worth my time. And that means we don't do a lot of cosplay stuff. So if you're in the Tampa area and want to take advantage of the cosplay market, just be cheaper than me. Uh, Cause there's really not a lot of people out there, but it is common that when cosplayers will call us, cause a lot of them are making out of EVA foam, they're makers as it is. I tell them, look, I can quote you, but I know it's going to be probably between $750 and $1,000. And before you say, well, that's too expensive, go buy your own printer and do it yourself. Go buy a Neptune 3 Pro Plus or Max, because they're big, and run one of those. Or now the new Solval SV06 Plus, assuming it's any good. Go buy one of those. Make your own armor. You don't need me for it. Uh, so, yeah. Ronnie says... I print sun shields for fish finders. Five prints per kilo, 50 euros per print. 20 to 25 euro spool makes 220 to 250, but it does take eight hours per print. So I would say that's actually not bad. Um, eight hours for a, 
for what a 200 gram print yes five prints per kilo so it's 200 grams um 50 bucks is a little low i would also look at how expensive the fish finders if the fish finders are 300 dollars, charging 75 euros would be fine if they're a hundred dollars charging 50 might be too much if you're making accessories for a product, you need to look at what the product itself costs. Because if the product itself is relatively cheap and you are going to be more expensive than the product, no one's going to buy it. But if you're making accessories for something that is quite expensive that doesn't have accessories already, well, maybe, just maybe, you can look at making a fair bit of profit on it. Price for what the market will stand. Not just covering your costs and a little bit of profit. If your market is expecting to pay more money for custom-made stuff, there is no reason you shouldn't charge them more for that custom-made stuff. You are a business. Your job is to make money. If you want to do charity work later, go do charity work. But for now, focus on paying your bills first. Because you're going to need to do that. Because I'll tell you, if there's one thing that banks and three-letter organizations don't do... It's give you forgiveness because you're building a business. They don't care. They've got bills to pay as well. And they will come collecting. Every time. Okay, they are $1,500 fish finders. Double your price. Double your price. I would bet dollars to donuts you don't lose a single client. In fact, you'll probably get more. But here's the cool thing. Right? If you've got 20 clients at $50 each. Let's assume they come back, right? Because you're doing one-off products. They buy it from you. They never come back. But let's assume they do come back and you lose and you double your price and you lose half of them. Your profit margins have still gone up because this is, this is great. You're now only paying the cost of 10 prints rather than the cost of 20 prints. You're making more money even if you cut your market in half. That's business 101. Raise your prices until it stops being economical to do it. Stop trying to be cheap because your target market understands value. And if they don't, find another target market because they, if they, if your target market doesn't value you, then you shouldn't value them. That's the way it goes, right? When someone wants a suit of armor for 50 bucks, I can't help you and neither can anybody else. And I sit there and try to explain to them why. So when they leave, they're educated and understand why. But if they've got three grand, by all means, we can help you out. We're going to make a gorgeous suit of armor every time. TNH Tabletop is here. Hey, how you doing? Uh, but yeah, Ronnie, dude, you could double your price, right? Like, you're less than 10% of the cost of the fish finder. How many people will buy a $30,000 car and put a $5,000 set of wheels on it, right? Or a $3,000 set of wheels. God, how often do you put tires on your car that are two or $300 a tire? Tires are not expensive to produce, okay? They're not. The molds are expensive, but you amortize that out over the cost of tens of thousands, if not millions of tires. But tire companies know that the funny thing about tires, nobody really wants the cheapest. Sure, the whatever cheap tire will probably work. But if I'm wanting to have the best tire on the market, I'm going to look at buying the best tire on the market. And I'm going to spend the money to do it. It is okay to have two different lines, right? Maybe you have a PLA one that's relatively cheap and you do it out of a white material so it doesn't melt. But maybe they want them in black. Do it out of ASA or PETG. PETG might be okay. But ASA will be totally fine. Charge 150 bucks. So you have your regular and your premium. Now you have two offerings and they'll wonder if they want to get the regular or if they want to spring for the premium. It's only 50% more and they might find that those added values might make it something that it's worth, 
that is worth buying for them. And if it needs to attach or something like VHB tape or something like that, include some pre-cut pieces of tape with the big boy, with the top of the line. But with the medium one or the tiny one, say, tape and other accessories sold separately and have Amazon affiliate links where they can buy it. Right? Because you're building a marketing strategy to push them up the line to the bigger product. You want them to buy the bigger product because your cost doesn't go up all that much, but your margins do. And including a little piece of tape or some screws and all that is pennies on the dollar for you to do so. But for them is an easy upsell because you are creating an atmosphere where the customer has to do no extra work. And a lazy customer is a good customer most of the, most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> so yeah, guys, right? You got to look at this market. And it's okay if you don't hit it the first time. Don't look at these, you know, influencers that talk about 10x and all that bullshit. You're not there. Right? How do they 10x their profits? They raise the price of their book. Move on. Right? And sure, they might have had some success in business. But ultimately, success in business is not just about knowing exactly what you need to know. It's about luck. It's about timing. It's about having the right marketing strategy. And it's about getting out there and getting shit done. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to be successful because only a Sith deals in absolutes. But I can tell you if you put in the work, you follow what, you know, the metrics tell you to follow and you know what will get you in front of the right people, you've done everything right. If you continue to not have sales, maybe look at the man in the mirror and ask if he should change his ways. That's a Michael Jackson quote for those of you that don't know. And if you don't know, I'm upset at you. <laughs> okay, we got a good question from Jake. Jake asks, how do I price my CAD time? It's by the hour, $150 an hour. That's what we charge. We started back in the day at 50 bucks an hour. That when we first started it was 50 bucks an hour. But that was also when the minimum wage in Florida was $7.25 an hour. Right? So we were paying probably in the $10 range. Um, but here's the deal with how I do CAD time. Um, we bill by the 15 minute increment, right? So if someone if if we go over by less than seven minutes we eat that. If we go over by more than seven minutes, we charge it to the customer. Um, but there will be times where a screw up happens or, uh, you know, we need more than one person on a job and we've already agreed to do the entire job for a fixed rate. I got to eat the cost of those extra people. And that's where profit margin comes in. But we pay our staff really, really well. Starting wage for a CAD designer for 3D Musketeers is $30 an hour. And we are actually hiring uh, people that are looking to get, it, uh, the people that have experience running specifically Fusion 360 and have a license for it. Uh, we do not provide you with that license. You need to have it. Um, it's not my job to tell you how to obtain that. You figure that out on your own. But uh, yeah, we bill high. We're not the most expensive in the area, but we did recently raise our price from 125 to 150. Not only does it make it easier for me to calculate how much money your bill is, it gives us more cash and enables us to give raises to all of our people. Prior to moving from 125 to 150, we were starting at $25 an hour. Now I'm able to start at $30 an hour for our engineers. And yeah, we're paying, we're charging 5X the starting engineer's rate. Here's the deal. A lot of times it's not the starting engineers that are doing the work. And a lot of our engineers make quite a bit more than $30 an hour. Now as a business, we're not busy all the time. I'd love to be, but it's a service-based business. That's what happens often where we're just not busy. And because they're all 1099s, if there's no work, they don't get paid. So I'm okay with paying them more money when we need to 
Because again, I want people to get paid well. Because when they get paid well, they work well. <laughs> Beard Kula says, premium products that don't come with a little required accessory like a bolt or, str or a cable strain relief. I'm looking at you, Maytag KitchenAid and Associated Dishwashers are such a headache. Yep. Yep. Daniel Cross says, always charge three times the money you want for yourself. If you have a restaurant, for example, a third is for you, minus tax, a third is for the staff, and a third for, as example, food. Uh, I can't say that's right. Restaurants will be lucky if they make 12 to 15% profit. That's it. And the owners get paid off of that profit. So a restaurant is all about volume. That's why McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's make so much money. Because they can push people through fast. Why when you go to uh, bigotry, I, I mean Chick-fil-A, and they've got employees with iPads, multiples of them in the line taking orders, because then they have less lead time. You go up, your food is ready, you grab it, you pay, you move on, you're done. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, Daniel says in the U.S. it's 12 to 15%, but it's different in Germany. Okay, that's fair, right? The U.S. is full of pure capitalism where we will take advantage of individuals for profit, which is bullshit. Don't do that. Don't be that. In other places, it is very much uh, we care about our people, and I want to exude that for my company. If you don't want to, then fine, but you're going to have a lot more turnover than we do. The only time we ever lose staff is when they get too busy with their day jobs and can't help us. They graduate and go to college or they get poached. I have never, ever had to fire a staff member ever because we hire the right people. They might leave. That's okay. They find better opportunities. They find something that's more stable. They whatever it might be. And I will always give staff members good recommendations. That's just a personal thing. Be nice to people. New fan sub says my boss was charging 5x ingredients price and he was breaking even. Then again, it was a nonprofit. It is okay for nonprofits to actually make a net profit as long as they are putting that money back into whatever their cause is. So if they're selling something at a profit, but they're reinvesting that money into their efforts, it's totally fine. What bothers me is when we have nonprofits, I'm looking at you, Susan G. Komen, that utilize the bare minimum of their money to go toward actual breast cancer research. You barely do anything. The problem is Susan G. Komen is a massive marketing company that can bring on the NFL, where the NFL will pay them a commission for every pink jersey that's sold, right? And they've got an amazing branding strategy, an amazing marketing strategy, but they donate less than 20% of their money to actual cancer research, or last time I looked, it was less than 20. So 80% of the money that comes in goes to salaries of employees, which their CEO makes a shitload of money well into the six figures. And I am totally fine with CEOs making six figure salaries, even for, you know, nonprofits, they're running the ship. But if your CEO is making seven figures in a nonprofit, it's time to audit your books and see really what are these people doing or are you just playing the game of let's load everybody's pockets? Now, again, I'm not accusing anybody of doing anything. That would be illegal of me. But I'm saying it just doesn't feel right. Think with your head here. News fan sub says also waitresses are paid 15 an hour 10 years ago. No tips. I love that method where you pay your wait staff regular livable wages. You don't require tips, but you know, customers can leave them if they want and they get them all. This whole idea of splitting tips is a tough one, but what you do is you pay your back of the, the shop people. So you have your, your front of shop, back of shop, back of shop are going to be the cleaning crew, the, the people that don't get tips right? Pay them better than you pay the wait staff if there is tips involved. But you need to assess what those tips will look like, right? 
give bonuses based on performance. Give bonuses based on the company. And if you feel comfortable, profit share. There's nothing wrong with it. Be kind to others. Because they'll respect the hell out of you. If you're mean to your customers, you're mean to your employees, you're mean to people around you, you're not going to have a target market. You're not going to have a niche. You're going to have a failed business or a really successful nonprofit, depending on which one you want. Um, Mad Cat USA says, I work for a nonprofit healthcare company whose CEO makes seven figures easily. They could be a not for profit. There's a distinction there. They're not for profit, but they're not a nonprofit either. Uh, and there's less distinction there and less paperwork involved. Um, they have to pay for the nose candy of the marketing division. Oh, stop it, you. You're a troublemaker, worse, Peter. Great guy, but you're a friggin' troublemaker. But yeah, guys, we're coming up at the two-hour mark, so I think it's good for us to call this one here. Um, I have been given a special request from PJ. Oh, Hey, you're actually here. Look at that. PJ has requested. I will read the tweet. PJ asks at 3D Musketeers or 3D underscore Musketeers. Could I make a very personal and a little self-serving request to have an additional in addition to your next sign off? Could you toss in a give your pets extra treats, extra love or anything? It's been a rough week for a lot of us makers and recently lost our sick fur babies. So, yes, yes, I can. This has been season three, episode 22 of the Making Awesome Podcast. Who are your customers finding your niche and understanding your target market? Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. Pet your animals more. Give them an extra treat. And, you know, think about those who have lost their pets and those that are without them, those that are suffering and those that are spending money at the emergency vets that they may not be able to afford simply because they care more about their animals they do themselves don't forget to call your loved ones and as always keep making awesome have a good one